So welcome, everyone, <laughs> each and every one of you, uh, to the final event in our series, Plato Goes Live. Final Live. Already? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're the only person. <laughs> um, so tonight, uh, we have a great show uh, for you. Uh, this is the third in our three Plato's in the Arts events. Um, focusing on the Republic and the moving image. We'll hear first from our very own uh, Matthias Hurst. We'll then hear from Shai Biederman, who's joining us from uh, Tel Aviv University and Beit Bell College uh, in Israel. And uh, then I will briefly um, make a kind of closing presentation, and then we'll move into an, a more informal um, conversation on the theme of the Republic and the moving image, so what it means to think together. Um, Plato's thinking in uh, the Republic, but especially his thinking about um, poetic uh, uh, reproduction um, in Book 10 of the Republic with a cinematic um, art practice, and a special focus, uh, perhaps, on um, the form of documentary. Um, so uh, that's our theme uh, for tonight, and my okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, there are so many things that could be said, and of course my dear colleagues will explore all kind of exciting stuff uh, regarding the public and the moving image. Um, the, the most obvious relation between Plato's Republic and uh, the moving image or motion picture film, of course, is the cave allegory, right? Because uh, this is this idea, this is image of you know people sitting in this dark cave, chained to a wall, facing the wall on the other side, in which you know, these flicking shadows are being shown. And look at that! Um, the source of it all is the light source, you know, behind that back. That's the cinema. So it, it seems. To me, not only to me, it has become sort of a topos in, in, in film theory, film history, that, that Plato was sort of the inventor of cinema or the first uh, <coughs> theorist of, of cinema. But what he describes, of course, is not the cinema, but the human condition. So our uh, limits in knowledge and perception in general, and no matter, no matter what, we do, what we try, we always somehow in this cave. We sometimes, as you know, Somebody can escape the case and brings back good news, but not everybody is so happy about that. But uh, that's sort of the, 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 the default situation, the normal standard situation of our perception, of our uh, way of understanding, seeing, trying to, to know the world, uh, sitting just in the cave and not seeing the real thing, but just appearances and semblances of, of, <coughs> of just shadows, figures, you know, kind of. So, uh, what does it mean then when we go to the cinema, since we are in the cave anyway, and then we go into another cave to watch flickering shadows on the screen? This is basically a cave within a cave, right? Mm -hmm. So what could we expect from this cave within a cave? Truth? Reality? Something authentic? <coughs> or maybe just imitations of imitations of imitations? Very difficult. So. Um, I want to explore in the first part a little bit the idea of truth, authenticity, and lie in, in images. Very, very general, very basic. And to do so, I would like to start with a very short clip, a very famous early film, actually one of the earliest films we have by the Lumiere brothers, made in 1895, the arrival of a train in the train station La Ciotat. A very short film, uh, silent of course, uh, you know, more than 100 years old, this is when film history begins. Let's take a look at that clip. I hope this all works. Um, and we have to...
So uh, uh, this is a, a kind of uh, an example for early, early film, and it is said it's one of these histories, these tales, legends maybe of uh, film history that when people for the first time saw the script, they were actually afraid that they would be run over by a drain. So early film spectators could not really see the difference between the representation and the real drain. I don't know if this story is true, but I mean, that's our topic tonight, by truth. And so let's see what uh, Socrates and Glaucon would have to say about this. <laughs> do you see the train, Glaucon? Yes, I do. Do you think the train is real? Well, I know that this is just an image of a train. The train in front of me is not a real train, but the cinematographic representation renders a rather accurate image. What it shows is very similar to a train. So you know it is just a representation of a train. But do you think this train represented here was ever real? Oh yes! I know that the train arriving at the train station happened many years ago, but it was recorded on film when it happened, and thus the train and the event were real at that time. I know that the train and the station and the people existed once, because I see this footage of the train, the station and the people right in front of my eyes. Do you mean that there is some kind of reality in this motion picture? Maybe a past kind of reality, since the event it depicts did actually happen in the past? Yes, this is what I mean. Would you say what the motion picture shows is true? Well, I guess it was true once. Is what was once true still true today? Or has it turned into a lie? Does truth vanish with time? I'm not sure. So, you know... <laughs> no. What happened now? Okay. okay, Socrates says. Let's take a look at the motion picture again. Is there anything in that footage that contradicts your ideas of truth? Is there anything in this representation of a past event that seems to be lying to you? Is there anything as part of the representation that corrupts your notion of authenticity or that subverts your own feeling of authenticity? Is there anything as part of the, uh, uh, of the representation that harms your ideas of <coughs> and your love for the good? No, by Zeus, it's just a motion picture. <laughs> right. There's nothing in the picture itself, in the picture as such, that could have these harmful effects. The picture is what it is, and it represents its content, as it were, without any ethical or ideological bias. We could appreciate what we see, as well as condemn what we see. The picture itself does not influence our decision here. And he continues, let me say it clear. The image as such, the image as purely visual phenomenon, does not lie. Actually, it doesn't matter if we recognize the image as a representation of a past event or not. And even if this train we see here, re here represented never actually existed as a real train, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the ontological status of the image as an image and its truth in itself then maybe it is our perception of the image that decides about truth or lie. Maybe it is our use of the image or our own specific relation to the image that makes it the difference. Maybe it is the context that we give to the image and that informs our perception and our understanding of it that is important here. Ah, context. What about context? Isn't context what makes an object or an event authentic and true in its present state? Isn't context the necessary knowledge that puts objects and events in perspective <coughs> for us? Isn't context the indispensable discourse in any case that enables us to rationally distinguish between correct and false, between truth and lie? Yes. So it is context that makes the difference here, not the image as such. But what exactly could be the relation between context and truth? Truth, if at all, exists only in the very moment and for the very moment an event happens. The actuality and presence of the event defines its authenticity and the presence also defines the context, which is the totality of circumstances that give an event its full meaning. There is a temporal bond between the presence, authenticity and truth right there when a thing happens. The next moment this bond does not exist anymore. Time takes events or objects out of the present context. One can record an event on film, take a picture of an object, but one can neither record the presence nor the authentic context. 
every form of recollection or representation encapsulates the event in question and isolates it from the original the true present context in order for a new and different context to be created or constructed each time we have this recollection or receive or behold the representation of the original event. Indeed, it is necessary to create or construct new context for the representation of the event, a new presence as it were, since the original context is gone and lost in time or sometimes even totally unknown or incomprehensible to us. This act of repeatedly creating a new context is what we call reception. It is our active part of looking at and making sense of images and motion pictures. Does the lack of one presence and one authentic context mean that there is a lack of truth in the representation? Maybe yes. This would imply that any representation, any image is a lie, because we usually perceive them out of their original authentic context. But then it is not the image or motion picture itself that lacks truth or truthfulness, but our reception, our use of it. So let's watch <coughs> another clip and see then what maybe Socrates and Clark have to say. <laughs> That's uh, from a Star Wars film, and this is very much about you know, CGI, special effects. Digital images created in the computer. Truth or lie, asked Socrates, in these exceedingly dynamic images. Oh, I don't know, I feel dizzy. <laughs> Let me put it another way. Do you think this space battle is real, Glaucon? No, Socrates, it is certainly not real. It is fiction. Is your feeling of dizziness real? Yes, it is, <laughs> but I'm feeling better already. <laughs> Do you think the footage is giving us an accurate impression of the idea of a space battle? Well, fortunately, I have never been in a combat situation like this, 
but I assume that this is how a space battle could look like and feel like. Nobody of us has ever been in a combat situation like this. As you have already said, this is pure fiction. Maybe the gods have an idea about a space battle, <laughs> but for the time being, we humans can only create fictional images about it. Then what we see here is not true, it's a lie. You are partially right, Clock. Mm -hmm. What we see is not true in the ontological sense, but it doesn't mean that we perceive a lie. What the images show is not true, because they show something that is not and never has been real. But the images per se are true. They exist in reality, in our reality, as a specific formation of visual stimuli, and as such they are effective. There is no object or event in history or in real life that this could be a representation of. It does not relate to anything authentic. There has never been a true present context to what happens here on the screen. So any context we might come up with while we watch it does not conflict with a true original context. The footage does not represent truth, but it is no lie either. This kind of motion picture clearly appeals to and entertains the emotional and irrational parts of human nature that I do not hold dear. And thus, I certainly do not appreciate this flight of fantasy at all. <laughs> but I have to admit that what we see here is a creation in its own right and not a representation in the strict sense. And as a creation of something that does not exist in our common world of appearances and semblances, as images that bear their own reality and do not simply reproduce or mimic elements of the world around us, this madcap space battle scenario defies my usual criticism of imitative visual art and poetry. So, uh, maybe you can turn the mic for a second. Um, this is what our friends at the Athens Film School have to say about this. Uh, to put it in my own words, trying to. Uh, what we see here is sort of a dialectical phenomenon or almost paradoxical <coughs> situation in the platonic sense. You know, images as such are both truth and lie. They are what they are. What we see in a picture does not lie to us, even if the picture is fictional. We see spaceships, or what we think are spaceships, what we can understand in our kind of limited knowledge. The image or a train, the image itself does not lie. But sometimes, or usually it's the context, mm -hmm. our understanding of it uh, that changes the meaning. Or if we take an event like the train arriving at a station that certainly has happened in the past, if we take this out of context, we watch it now more than 100 years later. So we add a new different context to it, right? And this is what changes the meaning. If you have purely fictional images, like the Star Wars thing, there is no authentic context that could be changed or altered. It is just what it is. So, of course, what we see is fiction. It is not true in the ontological sense. But the image in its ontological appearance is true. So images are, or motion images are, both lies and truth. Let's take a look at uh, documentaries. I mean, what we've seen here with the Lumiere film, the, the uh, first one, was certainly the beginning of a tradition in cinema history that we can see as documentary. But the interesting thing is that most of the things what we usually see as documentary is also staged. So a very famous example I want to show a clip from now is uh, Nanook of the North, made in 1922 by Rob Flaherty. It's a very famous film. People think this is the first full-length documentary that was ever made. Very impressive. Let's just take a look at the film. But I just uh, a scene from the film. Uh, the music we hear is not from the original film. It's uh, music that was composed in 1998 <coughs> by Timothy Brock and was added later to the images. But of course, the images were after the film in So it's a documentary about um, an Inuit called Nanook and his family living in the ca Canadian Arctic, uh, actually the Ungava Peninsula of northern Quebec, Canada. And Robert Floyd, he traveled there several times and tried to capture on film their lives, their way of life, and uh, hunting. So we see a scene from hunting here. Thank you. 
thanks for the nice support. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I know the, the suspense is just beginning, but we have to interrupt <laughs> anyway. Um, so as I said, a very famous classical film, a uh, famous documentary, the, the mother of all documentaries, as it were. Uh, only most of the scenes are staged. <laughs> Nanook even isn't called Nanook. And there's a, a scene in which they build an igloo, and in order to film inside the igloo, they had to create a special igloo without a, a roof. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff, and, and there's a scene in which he tries to catch a fish or something, and there's a dead, um, it's staged. So we have a clash of interesting concepts here. We, we see something that we perceive as a documentary, and that we understand as a documentary, but uh, and somehow, somehow, it is a documentary, right? Because there are some real elements here. But at the same time, it is staged. It's a world created for the purpose of being a documentary. So again, here we have a clash of different principles. And later we hear a bit more about that. Uh, uh, that what actually is it that the documentary captures? Is there something to be captured at all? Something that is without any influence, without any kind of Manipulation, as it were, recreates the feeling of something totally authentic. So where's the truth here? Again, to a certain degree, these images are lying to us. But on a different level, and we see what we see. Uh, I mean, also, I, I mentioned the musical score before, because this musical score gives us a, another context that was not part of the original event. Obviously not, right? But the music somehow... Uh, kind of uh, manipulates our feelings. There's tension building, there's just calmness, right? Uh, all kind of adds up to give us a specific idea of what we're supposed to see here. Uh, and if you just think about these numerous scenes when he's in his boat, uh, of course, there was a camera there, right? Mm -hmm. They changed the camera perspective. It's not an authentic uh, hunt for virus stage. I want to show a bit longer clip from another documentary, which is very interesting because it is about film. Right? It's uh, uh, called Forgotten Silver. It's made by Peter Jackson in 1995, and it's about the famous film pioneer Colin McKenzie, and who was almost forgotten. So thanks to this film, the tale was saved and not lost. Uh, <laughs> but it's very interesting how uh, these his films were f because he was remembered because of some films they found, and it's interesting just to figure out how these films were being found. Uh, so I start this now, I just have to give a trigger warning because part of the film is uh, an interview clip with Harvey Weinstein. So I hope you don't have <laughs> Okay, let's see this uh, about a filmmaker, Colin McKenzie, film pioneer. small town called Bookera Bay in New Zealand. Behind me is a house of an elderly lady called Hannah Mackenzie. I've known Hannah all my life. She's a very close friend of my parents who lives just four doors away. In fact, I remember coming to Auntie Hannah's gardens, as we call her, when I was about seven years old and playing in these trees over here. I didn't know a lot about Hannah Mackenzie back then. I knew that she was a widow. Her husband had died many years before I was born. So about a year ago, I had a call from my mother she said I should drop in on Auntie Hannah sometime because she was wondering if I'd be interested in a lot of old films that she had stored in a shed at the bottom of her garden. I wasn't expecting much. Hannah described them as a lot of old home movies that her husband Colin had taken. <coughs> I was expecting to maybe find a bunch of old home movies, drop them off at the film archive on my way home and that would be the end of it. What I found, sitting right here, was an old chest. I opened the chest and I found the most extraordinary collection of films. These were 35mm films. The tins were rusty, there were strange names on them, warrior season, films I'd never heard of. I had no way of realising the significance of these films at the time. We later discovered they were made between the turn of the century and the late 1920s by an extraordinary New Zealander. A man who is now going to join the ranks of the great film pioneers a guy called Colin McKenzie. At the archive, we get a lot of film coming in. It's uh, family parades, babies on lawns, 
Um, one of it's very interesting historically, you know, just dress, fashion, and things like this, but uh, Colin McKenzie's collection, on the other hand, is something totally unique. It's got a nice sort of move on there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I got a call from Peter, and he wanted to know if I knew anything at all about Colin McKenzie. And I have to say, I didn't know very much. The name wasn't totally unknown to me. I'd come across it in a couple of journals and a couple of old papers, but there was very little solid information to relate to him. Certainly there, was, there were no films that were attributed to him. We were very lucky to get the film in uh, when we did. It, it was starting to deteriorate quite badly, some of the reels, and I think within the five years, if it had to be found, uh, it would disappear forever. Imagine if a film like Citizen Kane was to suddenly come out of the blue. Uh, really, the discovery of this collection was, was that exciting and that intriguing. It's a treasure trove of um, films that are of major historic importance, not just for New Zealand, but worldwide. This New Zealand filmmaker is going to rank you know, with the greats like D.W. Griffith, and I think in some ways infinitely better. I've got to confess, Colin McKenzie was just a name I read somewhere in a book, in a history book, and he didn't have a lot of impact to me until this great discovery of all of his films and the historical research that's gone with it, and now I am just flabbergasted. This is just the greatest film discovery of the last 50 years. Here was this unknown genius who died in obscurity and who now belongs, you know, in the pantheon of, of great cinema artists and innovators. South Island farming community of Geraldine. His father, John Mackenzie, arrived in New Zealand in 1879. With typical Scottish pragmatism, he built his home and farm the hard way. John's young wife, Ellen, found country life difficult, but she took pride in her sons, Colin and Brooke. Colin, the elder of the two, was studious and introverted, the opposite of his brother. Yet the boys enjoyed a close bond. From sun up to sundown, they worked the land with their father, in whose footsteps they were expected to follow. Colin, however, showed no aptitude for farming. His interests lay elsewhere. The boy's uncle, Albert Drury, owned a successful bicycle shop in Timaru. It was there, in the workshop, that Colin discovered his passion for mechanical invention. Young Colin would often stay weekends tinkering with tools and spare parts. The boy's imagination needed an outlet. In the spring of 1900, he found it. The traveling picture show had come to town. It, it was like flesh from heaven, starting out of the darkness. And his whole heart lifted. He felt this was something he wanted to do and he would do. He just followed that picture show right around the district. And where the other kids had been gawping at the screen, looking at these lovelies and horses and things, Colin was at the back of the hall looking at the magic machine that was doing it on the projector. What fascinates me most about Colin McKenzie's early films, not so much the films themselves, but the technology involved. I mean, this was 1900, you know, five years after the birth of cinema, you can't walk into the camera shop and buy a movie camera to take home movies. Aged only 12, Colin built his first motion picture camera. Impatient with the hand crack technology of the time, Colin mechanized his camera with great ingenuity. When Colin rode the bicycle, his camera rolled, thus creating the cinema's first tracking shot. <laughs> Colin's later attempt to mechanize a home-built projector leapt way beyond pedal power. I don't know who else would have thought of using steam power to drive a projection system, but he did, and it worked. Well, he was clever enough to make his own film. He got flax leaves from down the swamp at the back of the farm, and he boiled them and boiled them, turned that into cellulose nitrate, and then he had to find something for the emulsion, he found eggs. Not eggs, egg whites. He used the egg albumin process, which they used in the 19th century for making uh, materials photosensitive. Um, he adapted that, though, to use for moving images. Trouble was that it took 12 eggs to make one minute 
soon. <laughs> That's all right, as long as he was making short films. Colin was caught red-handed. The precocious boy had been planning the world's first feature-length film. Colin was found flown into the lake. This was an affront to his dignity. He ranted and he raved, and he smashed up all of Colin's gear. Everything was destroyed. Everything, all his gear, except the camera, which his clever mother had hidden. Living less than 50 miles from the Mackenzie farm was someone who, like Colin, nursed extravagant dreams of invention. His name was Richard Pierce. In the early years of the century, Pierce constructed a crude flying machine and made several attempts to get airborne. Pierce's exploits have always been the subject of conjecture and legend. Some writers believe he flew before the Wright brothers, but no reliable proof has existed that he even got off the ground until now. Found among the films in the Colin Mackenzie collection was an astounding cinematic record. Seen here publicly for the first time is a piece of film currently being examined by the Smithsonian Institute, a fragment of celluloid that will forever rewrite aviation history. Minutes before takeoff, Colin positioned his camera above a wagon and waited. allows us to look closer. <laughs> the Wright Brothers' historic flight at Kitty Hawk was not until December the 17th, 1903. Richard Pierce, a farmer from New Zealand, had beaten the Wright Brothers into the air by nine months. But the thing that I find really funny is if you examine the footage, he's flying straight at Colin McKenzie, who's filming it, and he has to swerve to avoid Colin, and he crashes into the hedge. <laughs> and if Colin hadn't been there, he probably would have flown a lot further, and we would have all heard about it. His father confiscated the film, forbade in his dour way the boy ever to have anything to do with this newfangled filmmaking ever again. It looks like a documentary, it feels <coughs> like a documentary, <laughs> uses strategies of a documentary, but it's not true. There never was a Colin McKenzie. There was a, a Richard Pierce, a, this guy actually exists, and he had this kind of uh, aviation hobby, and he did fly in 1903. So that's part of our reality, right? But uh, no Colin McKenzie. So what is happening here? Uh, and this goes on for another hour, right? <laughs> 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 the, the, no, let's be honest. Did anybody at any point thought that this is real? The mm. whole time. Mm -hmm. The whole time. Until the eggs. Yeah, the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> but then it is true that in the 19th century they used egg white as emulsion. That's true, actually, mm. for, for f film or kind of light. Oh, the eggs. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, these 2000 eggs stalled, and that was a bit too much. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but also the camera on the bicycle. Anyway, um, <laughs> so what, what happens here? The film imitates structures that we do know from uh, documentaries. You know, these, uh, these old films that are scratched, the, uh, the still photographs, the, the interview clips with famous people, and of course Harvey Weinstein, that's a real one, Leonard Lan uh, Martin, the real one, right? Later there are some other real people <laughs> commenting on uh, Colin McKenzie. Um, so it, it creates this feeling of authenticity because it looks so much uh, like something we knew from other documentaries. It seems it's speaking the language of documentary which is, or which has become a convention. Right? So this film creates, as it were, its own context, 
uh, in which images are embedded. Also, the, some of the photographies, of course, they were real, real kids from the time. Some of the stuff are, uh, of course, the, the, the flight that was restaged and then, you know, uh, changed so it looks old and scratched. But uh, the, the photographies that we saw the family were real family photographies of uh, the, the co-producer of the film. So they were kind of authentic, but of course not part of the family. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we are learned to believe this is real because we see strategies of, of film narration, the voiceover interview clips as to photographies, that we know from specific contexts that imitate documentary. But this film, and actually every film, every documentary too, creates their own universe somehow. Right? They create their own reality. And in the end, maybe we, we never really know. I mean, if you see another documentary about another filmmaker and they would leave out the eggs, maybe we would start to believe that. I mean, I, it could very well be that because we never heard about this Colin McKenzie that he still was there, right? And because they've never seen or found his, his films, now they've discovered them. So now we have to rewrite history. Could be possible, right? So again, uh, our ideas of truth, reality, and fiction and lie are a little bit confused here, right? Kind of a little bit disturbed here. Um, I have another clip, but uh, maybe I'll leave that out so that uh, my <coughs> colleagues can also uh, talk, and maybe then Ian there might be some questions. So I, I would stop here and just try to conclude that the ideas of truth and lie in film in the moving image are a bit complicated. Uh, it seems as if we can see lies everywhere. I mean, we are living in a world of appearances. We are, according to Latham, we certainly never have the access to the real thing, right? the ideas, only if we step out of the cave. But if you're sitting in a cave and watching images, there's no chance to have a reality to see the truth. On the other hand, there is an inherent truth to all these images. An image is an image. It, it is what it is. Mm. Right? And only the context we apply to it, or our situation of perception, uh, our understanding of it, what we bring to the images, what we read out of the conventions of filmic storytelling, that is what could create something that is authentic or not authentic. Fiction, it is all. Okay. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matthias. I, I really, uh, I meant it when I said that I, I really can't stop that because uh, um, uh, uh, what, what, what would strike me during your lecture is that you are bit by bit and very carefully and very nicely walking us towards the edge of the cliff and what is left for me to do is only to push us <laughs> down the cliff. Uh, and into oblivion because uh, uh, basically uh, um, what you just uh, pointed out is that it's not that we cannot tell what truth is. Uh, it is maybe the question which uh, 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 triggers us in the sense that uh, and the mere concept or the mere uh, preconceived idea of something which is true as opposed to something which is, which is innately false this dichotomy is itself flawed, is itself a, 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 the reason for our bewilderment and not the inability to uh, achieve uh, any result, any resolution, any redemption or any answer. And this reminded me of a story which, is, which I very much like, um, a, a story about the production of the Coen brothers' a, a, a second but most famous film, which is uh, uh, Fargo from uh, in 1996. And the story goes that uh, they uh, decided to cast, uh, what is his name, uh, William, uh, oh, I forget the name. Uh, uh, Macy. Macy, William H. Macy, thank you. Uh, uh, they decided to cast uh, William H. Macy as the, lead, the leading man. And, and he was very pleased about it. And uh, um, he started wo wo working on, on the set and uh, he realized that, uh, and the Coen brothers uh, uh, explicitly uh, uh, said as such in the, in the opening uh, uh, um, words of the, of the film, 
that this film is based on a true story. Uh, and he realized that and he was very curious to know a little bit more about the <laughs> truthfulness or the true story uh, which uh, the film is based on. And uh, after a few uh, weeks on the set, um, he came to, the, to Joel Cohen and said, well, I have a, a, a free five minutes now. Um, Okay. <laughs> um, can you do, do you have free time now? Can you please tell me more about the story behind the, the true story behind the film? John Cohen looks at him and says, uh, "There is no true story behind it." William H Macy looks puzzled. But you you said it. You said this is this based on a true story. Oh, sorry, I ruined the entire story. This is a true story. That's what the, the, the phrase says. Joel Cohen looks back to me. It is indeed a true story. No? Ah, the penny drops. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So for the Cohen brothers, to be true uh, is something uh, meaningful as long as you take it away from the Platonic framework, which uh, 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 defines truth uh, versus uh, 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 fiction or truth versus lie, which defines the, the metaphysical groundings uh, uh, by which we supposedly have to uh, uh, um, analyze and conceptualize uh, every other uh, concept at hand, whether it's uh, identity or subjectivity or space or time or anything else. Uh, that uh, uh, builds our uh, conceptual world. Um, uh, this was the, the initial conclusion of the, 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 the uh, uh, journey you just uh, uh, um, it took us to. And uh, what I will try to do is to uh, uh, continue this journey uh, to uh, um, uh, an inside uh, uh, look at uh, documentary. Is that the presentation? Yeah. Uh, and I'll try to shorten it because if I if I actually read the entire thing, we'll uh, we'll finish tomorrow. Um, uh, I'll try to summarize uh, uh, bits of it and move as as fast as I can to uh, the words of Errol Morris. A, a, a the most astounding documentarian uh, uh, um, active today, uh, uh, um, um, whose films are, in my mind at least, uh, um, the, 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 the very apt work of uh, um, film taking philosophy differently, or taking philosophy as a post or neo or non-Platonic uh, sense. So. Uh, I'll begin with uh, uh, um, some, some, some preludes and then move to El Mois. In, the groundbreaking manifest, in a groundbreaking manifesto aptly called Camera Stilo or Camera Pen, the film theorist and, and practitioner Alexander Ustruk suggests that cinema can and should be considered as a totally independent means of expression. According to Ustruk, film by virtue of its aesthetic nature should be considered a, as a supreme resource for the most philosophical meditations on human, uh, on human, on human production. So much so, as Stroke further claims, that contemporary ideas and philosophies of life are such that only the cinema can do justice to them. In other words, cinema, according to Stroke's vision, can do much more than expressing ready-made and pre-cooked philosophical ideas. It can think independently, be or become a thought, engage with the world as a unique awareness, irreducible to language or to pre-existing philosophical concepts. This somewhat naive and probably over-enthusiastic manifesto has become an intriguing reality in the contemporary age of film-philosophy. Film theory today has altered substantially due to the paradigmatic shift of film philosophy. As a challenge to the hegemony of grand theory and, analy and analytic philosophy, film philosophy rejects the asymmetric relations embedded in the platonic philosophy of X paradigm 
and instead promotes, and I quote Robert Sinnebrink here, an alternative approach that combines aesthetic receptivity to film with philosophically informed reflection. Film philosophy as a way to aesthetically, of aesthetically disclosing, perhaps also transforming our experience of the modern world, is a way, an incentive one, one, one might say, for philosophy itself to reflect upon its own limits or even to uh, experiment with the new forms of philosophical expression. Um, I'll skip the part when I, where I uh, present the history of film philosophy uh, using two of the founding fathers of this kind of a, a, a realization about film. Um, by the way, their names are uh, Stanley Cavell and uh, uh, Jules Deleuze. Uh, and I'll move to uh, a, a maybe what is the most a, 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 a predominant example uh, following uh, uh, what you just told us about the Lumiere brothers. My example too is uh, 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 two films of, uh, of the Lumiere brothers. Um, just a minute. Um, yeah. um, I take, uh, much like uh, Matthias before, I, t I take the uh, documentary uh, uh, genre, the documentary films, as the ultimate test case for, for examining the new kind of philosophy, the new kind of cinematically uh, enhanced or cinematically uh, induced philosophy. And when it comes to documentary, I have to first, and uh, that's, that's the habit of traditional philosophy, I have first to define what documentary is, what this genre is all about. So far, the search for the definition of documentary has yielded two complementary approaches. One, the documentary as non-fiction approach, according to which the answer to the what is documentary question will be found within the fiction-non-fiction -fiction dichotomy. And two, the documentary as traces of the real approach, according to which the answer to the what is documentary question will be found within other dichotomies which correlate with concepts like truth, reality, and representation. From here on, I will focus on the documentary as non-fiction approach in order to flesh out both the inconsistencies within any definition of documentary, but also in the troublesome nature of the platonic method of questioning which innately abides these very dichotomies. Traces of this approach can already be found in the early days of cinema namely in two of the Lumiere brothers' most famous overtures, Workers Leaving the Factory, which, which we just saw, and The Gardener, both from 1895. In The Workers, we see, as the title so aptly proclaim, a group of workers, leave, a, a group of uh, workers leaving a factory in the end of a day's work. In The Gardener, by contrast, we engage a narrative. A gardener is busy with his daily work, failing to notice a rascal who steps on his hose, thus stopping the stream of water uh, from watering the garden beds. When the gardener finally notices the hoax, it's already too late to prevent the inevitable. He is all wet, and the viewers can only uh, take comfort by the fact that the rascal is amusingly spanked. The difference between the two films can intuitively be characterized as the difference between fiction film and documentary. The Gardener presents a work of orchestrated fiction, in which fictitious characters play a role in a well-constructed narrative. The workers, by contrast, presents reality for what it is. But in what sense, one might ask, is this uh, activity or event more real than the rascal standing on the hose? This is exactly what the question uh, Matthias asked us before. What is it that makes the march of the workers a cinematic depiction of reality? Similarly, what is it that uh, makes the events of the gardener less real for us? To render these questions even more bewildering, one is liable to assume that the march of the workers was orchestrated and, uh, and pre-designed by the intentional director or photographer. Truth be told, this was a actually this 
uh, is what actually happened on the seemingly unmediated stage of the Lumiere brothers. Of the Lumiere brothers, according according to witnesses, the brothers shot several takes of this event, each time shoot, shouting directions at the, and orders at the workers. The most common order was, somewhat prophetically, "Don't look at the camera." <laughs> Now, by the way, uh, since we saw a third uh, a Lumiere Brothers film, uh, uh, the notion of the historical fact that the audience, the viewers, flee the, the, the café, the Parisian café where the film was screened, uh, in horror uh, because a train was coming at them, is of course a complete myth. It never happened. Or did it? It never happened. <laughs> it's a complete myth. It's, it's a story. But the story can be true. We learned it from Joel Coyne. And uh, since the entire Western philosophy is based on another myth, another story, the story of the cave, then maybe we should uh, re-examine and re-evaluate the uh, truthfulness of stories and basically the, the nature, the, uh, the concept of a story, as opposed to what? I've mentioned two films of the Lumiere brothers in order to flesh out the inconsistencies uh, of the documentary as a non-fiction approach and of the platonic means of conceptualizing at that. Once raising the question, what is documentary, we immediately pro uh, propose a platonic answer. Documentary is such and such. Which we then maintain despite strong evidence to the contrary. Why do we do that? The answer stares us in our faces, so to speak. <coughs> the cinematic events uh, uh, presented in the workers are intertwined with our preconceptions about the nature of reality. The cinematic events in the Gardner, by contrast, are intertwined with another preconceived concept, namely that of fiction. In other words, the, pre, uh, the presupposed ontolo uh, ontological difference begs the cinematic classification. Accordingly, the, uh, uh, the attempt to define documentary as non-fiction fails, as it rests within the comfort by which we apply a preconceived ontology on a cinematic possibility we call documentary. And that's the entire story in a nutshell. The entire story which led, led philosophers to uh, first to re-examine film, the nature of film, the definitions of film, via the history of film, and then to realize that they, their examination is, is mute, is destined to be flawed, because the philosophical tools are tainted to begin with. And it is cinema of all things, and documentary as a specifically, a, a philosophically attuned genre, which led them to realize how flawed the philosophical tools were or are or were to begin with. And with this, I'll skip all these quotes by philosophers and film theory theorists uh, who support this, this conclusion, and move straightly to, uh, um, uh, to the works of Errol Morris, uh, Errol Morris, um, who is uh, a, a, an American philosopher turned private investigator turned superb documentarian. That's his biography in a nutshell. Um, and I uh, will examine a few uh, 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 slides, a few, uh, 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 um, uh, um, oh, sorry, a few instances of uh, uh, from his films in order to to show you how, how cinema does that to philosophy, how cinema exposes the, the flawed dichotomy which uh, underlines the philosophical practice since the days of Plato. Errol Morris is highly appreciated uh, in the documentary scene as an auteur uh, of many masterpieces, including Vernon Florida from 81, The Thin Blue Line uh, from 88, uh, um, and Mr. Death from 99. Despite the, unique documentary, the, uh, b despite the unique documentary achievements of these films, I will chisel them, uh, the embedded relations between documentary and film philosophy or philosophy from two of his more recent films, The Fog of War, 11 Lessons from the Life of Robert S. McNamara from 2003, 
and The Unknown Known from 2013. The two films respectively, respectively present the political and ethical biographies of McNamara, Secretary of Defense under Kennedy and Johnson uh, in 61 to 68, and Donald, Rans Donald Rumsfeld, who served in the same capacity under Ford and then under uh, George W. Bush. Uh, the schematic similarity between the two politicians is obvious. Both were powerful individuals who played key role in a maj in major crisis in recent American history. McNamara was active during the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Kennedy assassination and was among those responsible for the Vietnam War. Rumsfeld was a Nixon loyalist and President Bush's right-hand man on September 11 and uh, 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 subs subsequently one of the chief architects of the uh, Al-Qaeda Iraq uh, uh, nexus. Besides the actual roles in these events, there is another striking similarity between the two. Both politicians have a story to tell. Their own perspectives, perspective sorry, of these events, their way of retelling history, justifying their actions, explaining their uh, decisions or portraying their, their worldviews, if you wish, and ultimately re, uh, uh, recreating reality in the image of the justification uh, justificatory uh, systems. Both share the, uh, this generously with Morris and present absent, uh, the, sorry, the present absentee in his films who interviews them through an, through an apparatus of his own invention which he calls the interotron. And this basically is the interotron. A system of cameras and mirrors, the, inter the interotron enables interviewer and interviewee to stare directly both at the camera and at, the, and at each other. The interotron enables the interviewee and the, inter and the interviewer alike to merge with the camera, which in turn merges with the spectator's gaze when it becomes a projector. Uh, this merger of the unseen interviewer, the direct gaze of the interviewee, the camera, and the spectator via the interotron can be easily in uh, interpreted and more accurately uh, 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 experienced as a direct access to an unmediated and therefore verifiable truth. Once everybody is looking at everybody else at the same time, it, it creates, in, in, in our experience, in, in our conceptual world, it creates like a, a singular point, which is like the, the, um, the infinity of, of, of truth. Of it, it's actually there. Everybody sees the same thing. Therefore, it's a very, a verifiable as truth. The Interotron is by far a wonderful device which extends the philosophical capacities of cinematic apparatus. Mm. These two pictures are taken uh, uh, via the interotron. Um, however, and though using the interotron profoundly and profusely, Morris does not give up on the traditional tools of his practice. For instance, the selection of different shot types or, uh, or the uh, uh, proportionally, uh, pro proportionality sorry, of frame design. In terms of short types, Morris often switches between various degrees of close-ups. In terms of frame design, he positions his characters in various points across the frame. At times, on the left half of the frame, at times on the right, at times on the bottom, at times uh, in the case of McNamara, all over the frame, in a, some, uh, in a somewhat horrific and horrifying extreme close-up. Have a look at this. You can show you Rumsfeld like this, like this, like this, and like this. Like Rumsfeld moves within a framed 
reality. And he looks at us at all the time, but always from a different angle, in a different way, but not because he looks to the interatron. And it's the same singular point in space, the same a, a truthful a, a point within our conceptual world. With McNamara, it's even, as I said before, more horrific because McNamara can move from the bottom to, of, the, of the frame to the top of the frame, but he can also occupy the entire frame. And there's something very, a, a, a very telling, very a, a perceptual in this kind of a, a, a shooting. In addition, Morris occasionally a, a, a surprises his viewers by abandoning, all of a sudden, you know, without a, 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 a warning, by abandoning the interotron and presenting his character from various different angles a, a, or, a, through, or through other devices, like various kinds of mirrors. For instance, this is a shot of, uh, of uh, Rumsfeld telling his story, his uh, 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 perception of, of, of reality. And this is uh, um, uh, <laughs> Rumsfeld looking at us through the interotron, but also there, there are a couple of mirrors behind him which uh, duplicate the, the, the image. And this is McNamara being shot through a, a, a skewed mirror of a, 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 of, of a car, of a moving car. The cognitive dissonance between the unified, seemingly objective, direct axis of the interatron and the polyphonic nature of its sudden absence or the use of short types that, uh, and design styles creates the imagistic equivalence of an epistemological cacophony. And that's exactly what Morris is trying to create in our experience and further that in our conceptual a framework which understands or undermines or underlines, sorry, this experience. Adding that to the ethical unease one can find himself in while listening to the justifications of the former secretaries, it is fair to suggest that Morris achieved a state of philosophical experience, philosophy in action, uh, to recall uh, Stephen Mulhall's uh, famous phrase, which uh, uh, attacks us, attacks our, our cognitive capacity, attacks us, our platonic dispositions, and forces us to react to them. However, while the ethical questions one might engage while watching the two former secretaries just, uh, justify their action springs from the words they use and the language they construct, the epistemic, the epistemic conundrum, if it is to occur while watching these films, is the result of the film's imagistic and pictorial nature. In other words, when it comes to epistemic questions regarding the sustainability and coherency of truth, it is the documentary image and not the documented word of the interviewees that carries the philosophical torch. Um, I, I, I will skip further uh, uh, down in order to show you what, what I mean by this last sentence, especially because uh, uh, Morris in these two films is almost obsessed with words, much like his interviewees. Who, uh, uh, whose, whose, whose words are uh, uh, the, the, the voice over, uh, the, the, the uh, substractum of the uh, uh, telling of the, uh, of, the, of the history. Maurice too picks on their words, but it's not the words themselves, it's not language itself, but the way he imagistically presents the words which does the trick, which philosophizes, if you wish to, to, to use this term. For instance, when a, 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 I think it's, a, it's, it's McNamara, yeah. when McNamara justifies his actions 
in, uh, which uh, preceded the Vietnam War. And he uses the phrase, he uses the term, ethical truth. And he uses it quite, uh, quite uh, substantially, quite in, 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 in confidence. There the, the are ethical truth and there are ethical lies and, 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 and one has to find himself in between. There's a, the platonic framework all over the place. Errol Morris doesn't show us McNamara saying these words. He, show us, he shows us the words. The words which we supposedly read, but also experience. Experience as images. Experience as the true works of a documentary cinema. And we see the words ethical truth fill in the entire frame. They are bombarded on us, much like similar terms like moral law or like free will. As opposed, for instance, to other words. Other words which are here taken from, and I'll skip reading this, this part, which are taken from a memo uh, Donald Rumsfeld wrote to President Bush. A memo about the eternal question if uh, whether Saddam Hussein has a, a weapon of mass uh, destruction. Uh, destruction. And in, in one of his linguistic or cognitive linguistic ways to justify uh, the uh, policy or the approach towards Saddam, Rumsfeld uses the term to keep him in the box. And the term in the box is, how do you say it? In, uh, like, uh, in, in quotations. So the term itself is presented while being contained, while being visually contained, that is, while being visually inside a box. The other term, the term that breaks free, the term which is more lucid, being out of the box, the cat is out of the box is without uh, 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 quotations. And this is how Rumsfeld wrote his memo, or typed his memo. Really? Is it an authentic memo? I'm, I'm uh, uh, recreating your, your, your final question. Is it an authentic memo? Is this Donald Rumsfeld's well, it's not a handwriting, so is, did he, or one of, on his behalf, typed it? Is this an authentic memo? Well, yes or no. What do you mean by authentic? That, this is what should be the, 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 the real question here. So it's not authenticity, if it means anything anymore. It's the way these words, these terms, get their meaning from the way they are presented. The time, they take it, the time it takes to present them, the way, the cinematic, the pictorial way by which they are presented, their sequentiality, you know, the fact that this term is presented uh, for three seconds, followed by this term for only one second. You know, there's there's a, 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 an added meaning that comes from the from the, from the presentation, the moving image presentation uh, on top of the images themselves, and so on and so forth. And this is only, uh, only brief examples of, of, of uh, uh, the way Errol Morris, uh, uh, it, it would be wrong to say that he plays with, with words, he plays with images. They happen to be images of words, but not just words, images of concepts. Images of concepts put into words to create an ideology, to create a story, to create perspective. Perspective of facts, perspective of truth, perspective of what really happened and how I, I am not to be blamed for what happened. 
Yes, if I'm McNamara or uh, Ramsfield. Other examples include a, 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 a further techniques when he abandons the interviewees, <coughs> abandons the interotron, and, and obsessively focuses on the words, on putting them, a, arranging them, rearranging them, cutting them into separate words, in order, if only to show us what a, 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 a Ludwig Wittgenstein knew best, that, you know, all the problems of philosophy are actually problems of language. You, you, so, you solve the language, you solve the philosophical problems. Of course, uh, things that you cannot talk about, you have to be silent about them. Have you ever tried to be silent about something? That's exactly the point of, of, of collision, the point of, of absurdity, which Wittgenstein found in language, but language of Wittgenstein was not only therapy, it was the face of philosophy, the face of uh, all, all the philosophical problems. What we can see here is that, of course, a, 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 the, the sentence that is being structured here is, of course, a, 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 a policy, a, a statement, an ideology, a piece of truth plucked from, from, from our conceptual work, w world and being a, a, a hashed and hashed again uh, in order to be broken to, literally broken to pieces. By the way, you notice that I, say, I said literally, and it's anything but literal. It's imagistically, if, if it is anything. Um, <coughs> I'll skip to the next, uh, 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 the next slide, uh, uh, um, just uh, 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 to show you that he also uh, 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 he enjoys the mirror imaging, right, of the, uh, uh, of the, of the words, of the images. Uh, uh, um, uh, which he, he puts uh, one uh, after the other in order to uh, uh, create the, um, uh, um, its downfall. Um, he enjoys very much toying with, with uh, statements and with uh, 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 dictionary definitions in, only, uh, in order to show us that, uh, uh, for instance, if you, if you say that w uh, words are being dropped, they are actually being dropped. They, they actually drops them into, into oblivion, into chaos. And of course, when Ramsfeld, the very anal kind of uh, approach to uh, reality, to, to facts, to history, every term that he uses, he first defines. He first uh, make sure that we understand what, 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 what he's referring to. So when he talks about torture or brutality or dictator, so if you are Errol Morris and you are, uh, 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 you're trying to re-philosophize the, 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 the verbal and the cognitive and the uh, uh, imagistic reality uh, in front of you, then once a dictionary, a philosophical dictionary is being used, why not? make it into an image. And this image, these images of, of uh, 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 um, definitions start to uh, 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 tumble and over, over, uh, oversee and overlook uh, Ramsfeld himself. He's, uh, at one point, he's surrounded by, literally and figuratively and imagistically, surrounded by uh, definitions. And they, they uh, 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 aim to, to, to conquer him, aim to uh, 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 overwhelm him, and probably us too. Um, and then we come to the, uh, 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 what lends uh, its name to the title of the, the latter film, The Unknown Knowns. Then we come to this, this magnanimous phrase. And this goes back to a, a press conference that uh, Ramsfeld had uh, when was it? At 2002, while trying to summarize and, while, and by doing that to justify uh, the, the American actions in, in Iraq, he said the following. Reports that say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because, as we know, there are no knowns there are things we know we know. We also know that there are known unknowns. 
that is, that, sorry, that is to say, we know there are things we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we do not know, we do not know. And if one looks throughout the history of our country and other free countries, it is the latter category that tends to be the difficult one. And of course, it's the third category out of four categories after he failed to mention the fourth category. Maybe because the fourth category undermines the entire ability, the entire philosophical structure which allows us to a, a, a combine the known and the unknown to begin with. And the fourth category is, of course, the unknown knowns. The, thing we don't, the things we don't know, we know. Okay, I'll repeat that. <laughs> the things we don't know, we know. <clears throat> you know how to play squibble. We just don't know what squibble is. But once I'll let you know what squibble is, you'll know how to play because to play squibble is just to do like this with your hand for five minutes. You know how to do that, right? You just don't know that you know that this is squibble. And basically, the unknown knowns are a conundrum for any platonic attempt to set things, uh, 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 to present a, a metaphysical array of dichotomies of you can either know or don't know. You can't not know what you know because if you don't know what you know, then it, it, it's a paradox in any traditional sense of the term. And that's why Ramsell uh, didn't mention it. And that's why Morris named the film after this fourth category, this Wittgensteinian category. Um, uh, I'll move to the, to the closing remarks because I, 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 I surely believe that the, the, the point after uh, Matthias did such, such an excellent, led us in such an excellent way uh, uh, to this point. Uh, I, I think that the point is, uh, is, is, is by now is clear. I'll just uh, uh, show you two additional examples as to how uh, 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 Morris uh, 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 um, uh, structures this, this new reality, this new concept of truth, of possibilities, of uh, 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 images as philosophy in, uh, in these two films. For instance, in The Unknown Known, he begins the, the, the first shot, the first, the first uh, sequence of the film, is uh, the words, the unknown known, which is, which is what? It's a philosophical statement? Yes, but not only. It's the name of the film. The background is a wide, unframed ocean, empty yet full with, full with water, presumably. Uh, uh, um, scary yet calm. Unframed, but framed, because it's a film. The film has a frame, the film ends at a given geographical point. The unknown needs this visual background in order to get its meaning, get its new framework. When you add the next shot, which is a low angle shot, of an archive, an archive of records, of films, of words, of images, I don't know. It's a record of knowledge, of things we know. And we know we know because it's there. And the camera moves slowly from a very low angle, showing these two pillars of, of wisdom, these two pillars of, of knowledge. And then we have the final shot, <laughs> produced and directed by Aaron Morris. So we can very easily, and because we are we're a, 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 an habitual a, a, a moviegoers, we have our, our habits which will 
engraved in our culture for, for, for decades now, we know how to create a meaningful sentence out of these three shots. The, the bewildering ocean and the bewildering philosophy plus the preconceived assumption that there is knowledge, there is a, a, a concrete and sustainable framework in which knowledge makes sense equals Errol Morris. Um, another such example, um, okay, I'll, I'll skip this, which is pretty much a, another one. Another uh, nice example with, with which I'll, I'll, I'll finish this, uh, this brief uh, presentation is he does the same with images of subjects. And when once, while, uh, sorry, while uh, Ramsel mentions uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Usama bin, so of course, Usama bin Laden, <laughs> and then mentions Saddam Hussein. Morris presents them <laughs> as one. He pre well, you just mentioned the a, a notorious evil, and added the his his second in command, his his brother to 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 the mischief. <laughs> the other uh, 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 evildoer of, of, of modern time. So let's make them into, the, into, into one, into one huge manifestation right, of the concept of evil. Concept of evil, which is, uh, again, in the Platonic tradition, is part of a dichotomy. There's evil, there's good. There's uh, a, 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 a beauty, and there's ugliness, and so on and so forth. But then, Morris uh, 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 says something as, as if he said, I'm only joking. Because he gives us another picture, another image. Well, he looks very much like this guy. But on the other hand, he looks like, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the uh, uh, clerk from the municipal office I just visited the other day. He looks very friendly, look, he's smiling, he has, he, he looks like a, a regular, uh, ordinary man. But then of course, sorry, but then of course, he's not. He's not because he is the vicious image uh, of uh, evil, which is a different image of evil, which is this guy, which is this guy. So all these guys are blended into, uh, into each other in a way which uh, 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 makes it uh, uh, impossible for us mm -hmm. to stick with our presupposed uh, uh, concepts. Um, this, in a nutshell, was uh, uh, um, uh, the way by which Errol Morris it takes on the conclusion uh, 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 from uh, 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 Matthias' presentation and uh, makes the documentary, documentary genre or documentary film and film at large because uh, it was the great uh, Bill Nichols, a film theoretician, who, says every, who said every fiction is documentary and every documentary is fiction. And Morris gives us a, a, a very a uh, thorough example as to how, thing, how these things uh, really are. Thank you. Um, so it's this, this bottom line here. It is not the image or the motion picture itself that lacks truth or truthfulness, but our reception, our use of it. And so the substance of um, my thoughts on the Republic and the Moving Image uh, in, in response to what we've heard um, about, um, about the truth of uh, the image as uh, such, as opposed to the image as a representation, is just to say that um, in Republic Book 10, there's the famous um, text, which happens at 601D to 602B, if you want to look it up, where we have the three levels of being and that what we think we know about what Plato has to say 
about uh, truth and, and representation in poetic creation is the imitation of an imitation uh, analysis where you have the form that was created by God and then you have um, the real thing, say a couch, right, or a chair that was created by a human artisan as an, uh, as an imitation and then there's what a painter maybe makes or a poet in speech which is an image of an image of the real thing but that's not really the three um, level analysis that Plato Socrates wants to stick with, but rather um, what happens a bit later, um, which is uh, where the three kinds of uh, skele is the Greek here, the, of uh, object or artifact or um, furniture, uh, maybe, um, where, um, where it's no longer uh, a divine artisan, but rather uh, a human um, maker and um, a, a user um, of the object, and then the one uh, who has neither the um, knowledge of the object, say a flute, um, but um, uh, or of its use. And so I think that this is um, what uh, we saw here in the dialogue, <coughs> that it's not um, the artifact um, itself, it's not uh, the um, the reality of what is represented um, in a cinematic production, but rather the way in which uh, we receive it and the way that we um, respond to the context of the recorded image um, as we reflect on our own experience in the world. Um, that is the proper um, place for analysis. Um, so I guess I, I just wanted to return uh, to that um, to that suggestion and to uh, open it up if anyone had a, a question, um, and then uh, to our colleagues uh, here to reflect on what positively that means uh, for the truth of the object, uh, and if it is the case that it's possible to put behind us in some way. Uh, an old story about a dichotomy between truth and lie, then what that new truth looks like rather than simply embracing the lie as truth, which might be another alternative um, explanation. The same could be done, by the way, with Joel um, Cohen's statement, right? I mean, what does that mean uh, to say that the story is true? Does it just mean that the only truth there is is stories, which is to say, lies are truth, um, and, and sort of embrace the Orwellian counter things that that looks like, or is there some sort of positive uh, construction uh, that we can make of that, where stories are uh, somehow truer than the truth we thought we were looking for? Um, I don't know if anyone had a further reflection or wanted to riff on that or ask a question. Orwell has been overruled. It's now Trumpian. Right, right, we're post We're post or well. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the crazy things about book 10 to me is the fact that, you know, you have the tragedian or the poet, and then you have God creating this form. And Plato, for some reason, inserts the painter. And I think the insertion of the painter in the place of the poet, or in place of the tragedian, is this swindle. Mm -hmm. It really is, because when the painter, or the filmmaker for that matter, makes a couch, the couch has a color, has a number of legs, has a number of cushions, has a particular kind of fabric, has a feel, a look. And when the poet creates a couch, it's actually quite a bit like the couch that the philosopher creates. You say couch, you give the audience or the, the listener, you know, a, 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 an idea, a form, an ideal sofa. But Plato can't tolerate that because that essentially equates the poet with the philosopher. So he swaps in this, this metaphor. He swaps in the substitute, the painter. And the painter is giving you this thing that's locked down. But, but, the, but Homer's not locking anything down. 
So that, that, that's always been a fast move in book 10 that, that has always um, sat with me as a kind of swindle, an intellectual swindle. He doesn't, he doesn't sw swap anything out for any, uh, any of the other levels of reality. But when it, comes to the, when it comes to the poet, he needs to give you a painter instead. That's something that has been explored uh, linguistically with the uh, prototype theory by Eleanor Rush, I guess was her name, that we, we use these words that give us an idea of a prototype which is a little bit like the idea mm. that is uh, not a specific object, but it's kind of including the general idea of an object. Like when we, we use the word or couch or yeah or dog, I guess she, she works a little bit the idea of dog. Everybody has an idea about a dog, a uh, prototype, but of course the dogs in the world look all differently, right? So there's this kind of uh, linguistic thing that kind of reflects on this trick or this swing that you're saying that uh, we, we change somehow uh, the, the, the specific art from painting from the visual art to, to a more uh, verbal or linguistic art that actually triggers these kind of things that are more like forms or ideas that evoke different images and pictures in our mind. But if, if the world is that of dark rabbit mm -hmm. and the painter you were referring to earlier is M.C. Escher who paints staircase which leads to itself. I don't really understand what I just said. <laughs> Is it at all possible to understand a staircase outside our platonic concept of what a staircase, what an image of a staircase, what various staircases in the world might look like, what are the shared denominator, what are the, the accidental characteristics, and, and so on and so forth. Every, any attempt to uh, articulate staircase does not include any possibility in which it leads to itself. And yet it does. And this thing's Is it not a staircase when it, when it does that? Since you mentioned Escher, I mean, we've seen this in cinema, Inception. We actually see people mm -hmm. we actually in, see in the motion, see it, moving uh, picture, uh, people exactly going up yes. the stairs. Three dimensional Escher. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So this even is this kind of mystery put into action, right? So. And, and the same goes with words. I mean, the, 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 the dark rabbit example is a Wittgensteinian example to show you that a, a word, a concept for that matter, a, a has to have an imagistic equivalent. Mm. And sometimes, when it comes to dark rabbit, the imagistic equivalence is not just an equivalent. It's the concept itself. The concept is, is imagistic. Mm. It's pictorial. Because you have to. Much like what the, the great philosopher Morpheus told his novice student, Neo, in the book, sorry, in the film, The Matrix. I can't tell you what The Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself, by which he meant you have to experience it. You have to be the matrix in you know, order to understand the matrix. And only then you understand it. And only then will understanding be available. At least it was based on a true story. <laughs> <laughs> like the space battle. Um, I think this is more oriented to Matthias's various examples. Um, it, you know, it strikes me that there's a couple of um, different ways of uh, being alive that uh, that you're describing that come up a lot in you know narrative theory, and I'm, I'm thinking about the difference between. Um, something that is, I mean, so clearly most film is indexical in some way or another. I mean, it's, it's, it's a reproduction of something. And so the unique example that you gave that isn't that is um, from Star Wars, where we're actually seeing something that, that was never filmed, right? Um, or at least this one wasn't. The old ones were models, but this one was not. Right, so that we're actually watching something that, that isn't a representation of something, but everything else is. And so even the scenes that are, art of, uh, that are constructed in such a way that we may call them fictional for, for other reasons, right? So there seems to be the one that's like the non-indexical 
type of film, um, the non reproduced, right? And then there's this other, pro you know, so that seems like its own little problem. Um, and then it seems like that's a very different problem from the, um, the, the, the film that we're watching that's clearly of something that occurred, but we're just looking at how to kind of think about it. Um, and it, it makes me think of another cone, uh, Dorit Cone, who would, <laughs> who would say um, that, you know, what we need is a signpost approach. It's like, which is to say that we understand that something is to be taken as real if we have the appropriate signpost, that it's called a documentary, mm -hmm. right, or that it's called a work of fiction, and that this is the orientation that allows us to, um, to, uh, to interpret the context. Um, and that the play of something like a mockumentary is that, I mean, you enjoy it only as a mockumentary when you know what's going on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Another resolution that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's even, it's very confusing because there's a there's a whole spectrum, right? So we have the films that somehow present something that's pro filmic that have some objects that are representations, and then we have these totally made up things. But there were people in between, right? And then there are these mixed forms as we all know from films like um, Forrest Gump or even Citizen Kane start with this news reel in which they integrated thanks to modern technology people into historical documents. So we see Tom Hanks actually shaking hands with, uh, with uh, John F. Kennedy. So uh, modern technology, and I guess we could say this even more general, modern, the modern world, modern communication um, technology, modern media that we're surrounded by, has created all kinds of different levels of reality. Uh, and I'm not, not even referring to fake news, but uh, we see stuff and uh, uh, mixtures of real elements and non-real elements. Uh, uh, I mean, today, I guess there's not one film, feature film in the cinema that has not some of computer-enhanced images. Sometimes we don't, we don't even see this, right? We're not supposed to see it. Uh, a space battle is an obvious example because we know this does not, as far as we know, exist, right? But in, in many other films, we just see landscapes that are slightly changed with the color and the light. Uh, is slightly changed. So uh, lie happens there already, or a kind of breaking through what we was supposed <coughs> to be authentic or truthful, uh, but we accept it. I was also thinking about what is the, the meaning of these mockumentaries? What, are they maybe even falser than false because they, in a kind of playful way, pretend to be authentic? Why not just tell a story about Colin McKenzie as a straightforward feature film? Maybe it wouldn't be fun enough. Uh, maybe this whole thing about documentary and uh, this new wave of horror movies, right? We talked about this in the afternoon. That t t uh, there's a whole tradition of horror movies these days that adapt what we know from documentary films, uh, the found footage films, you know, this shaky hand camera. Uh, why creating these appearances of reality, authenticity all the time? Uh, I mean, that's something that cinema is doing from the very start, but at the same time, films, and the most successful films these days, are films that totally not show us reality. Dinosaurs, spaceships, robots, 3D. We haven't even talked about 3D. 3D is a very strange phenomenon because it's supposed to make things more spatial, but of course it looks strangely artificial. Um, what are we looking for in 3D? Uh, so there's this desire, this yearning for something that looks authentic, but making us feel kind of comfortable by knowing it's not really authentic. Uh, horror films are the more effective if they are made in this kind of found footage style. Uh, they, they seem to be more real, but of course we do know they are not real. We accept this. It's a convention. Uh, so it's a very strange territory that actually, as Shai said, that, that kind of totally... Uh, uh, tears, the, this platonic uh, dichotomy, a, th a, a sunder, right? we, we have to th think about something in between, or we have to, to think anti-platonic at all, right? We come up, we have to come up with new ideas about authenticity, right? And uh, what is true, what is not true, because we are looking for these kinds of lies. We like these lies. Uh, but we don't in a, in a kind of moral sense, we don't see them as, we don't perceive them as lies. We take them as what they are. And, 
so it's it's a very wide field here, and it's indeed a very strange, different uh, uh, categories, subcategories about this mix of real stuff and fictional stuff, and it all it's in this kind of huge cauldron. Of kind of we, we look at lies and we realize that the, the mere dichotomy, which positioned them as lies, yeah. as opposed to truth, yeah. the mere dichotomy stop. Uh, it doesn't function anymore. Yeah. Doesn't function uh, the minute we say that uh, 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 we use this term, this conundrum, virtual reality. If it's virtual, it's not reality, and if it's reality, it's not. There's nothing virtual in it. But yet we we say it so freely, so 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 so. Uh, we can uh, say this because we know for long now that there is no reality. Right. <laughs> We're sitting in the cave. <laughs> We're sitting in the cave. There's no reality at all. So we can be totally cave. relaxed about all these illusions. <laughs> just because that's what it is. Where's reality? What is reality? Does any documentary ever come to reality? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> could, could one of you address the problem of what we call the suspension of disbelief? I mean, Socrates mm -hmm. talks about how you know a, a certain mm -hmm. image that's produced by a, a painter uh, can fool foolish people or small children. But even small children know on some level that the story that they're being told is fiction, right? And they suspend their disbelief in order to inhabit the story. Hmm. Where is, with respect to, to the Republic or, or with respect to something like... Maybe Schiller would have the aesthetic, sorry, <laughs> Schiller. <laughs> no, the aesthetic, uh, education of the aesthetic, uh, uh, aesthetic education. I mean, if she says, uh, uh, der Mensch ist nur Mensch, wo er spielt. So they, w w w as, as a species, somehow we like this playing. We like, to, we like to be fooled in a positive way. Uh, we enjoy this. I mean, this is why we have this huge entertainment industry and uh, why people watch these films and why people have so difficulties to accept what Platon is saying in the, the tenth book, right? And but, but in the tenth book, Socrates says this. He says, we enjoy it. We yeah, enjoy but, but, but of affiliating course ourselves, that, right? associating that, yeah. with the, the emotions of the hero who's being brought low. Yeah. Yeah. But he criticizes that, and I guess that most <laughs> of us would say, well, no, I mean, we love a good story, we love a good book, piece of literature, we, we love a good painting, we, we love a good film, right? There's nothing pretty and, and, bad and, and about after it. After all, it's only a device, it's only a convention that we invented in order to make our life easier. Uh, it's like the fourth wall. And breaking the fourth wall. It's, it's like the Intelton, basically. It, it, it's a device which helps us to uh, uh, communicate uh, in, a, in a more or less coherent way. Until it stops functioning, until there's this, this uh, green uh, 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 system error. <laughs> and where the system error, we have to invent a new, a new device to get free from devices. <laughs> I, I was struck with the problem of um, dealing in a postmodern way, such in, as in the documentaries of Aaron Morris, which unfortunately I haven't seen yet, with uh, ethical questions, uh, with basically having to deal with truth or lie in, in an ethical sense, because after all those two films about Robert McNamara, Donny yeah. Rumsfeld, yeah. they're about yeah. people yeah. who have been criticized, they're, they're defending their actions, and the way they defend them normally is, in a way, very postmodern. They they kind of make their assumptions explicit. Um, they basically say the pros and the cons. They kind of um, exhibit some sarcasm. They distance themselves from things. They they put up an elaborate system of smoke screens in a in a sense. But um, Errol Morris, the way you presented it at least, is in a way. Mm, maybe not forced, but doing it in a sense, doing something very similar, because being postmodern means um, showing that <coughs> you know that things are not that simple, that our these simple ideas about truth and lie we cannot deal with anymore, the world is complex, that everything is kind of truth and kind of lie, but then you, you play with those concepts, you make them explicit, you, you smash them again, you do other smoke screens, you exhibit sarcasm, as in the sort of juxtaposing images of Saddam Hussein, something like that. But in the end, um, what drives you, probably as a documentary, as a filmmaker, and in your choice of portraying these things, is actually something um, about truth or lie in a, in a very ethical sense. 
So the question for me is whether this is more courageous doing it in this way or whether it's in a way kind of cowardly because you're saying everything is everything, you know, and everything is relative in a sense. And, um, but then in the end, you still kind of feel like you own some sort of truth. Um, and I, I don't know whether you had any no, thoughts yeah, of I, this difficulty, whether that's actually better or worse. Well, I, in a sense. I, 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 I have Sorry. thoughts and I have uh, my, my, my opinions, mm -hmm. and personal uh, favorites. And uh, I, um, I cannot but see Evan Morris as a, as a, as a great, cinematographer, great filmmaker, mm. uh, to the point that I prevent myself from judging him uh, on, an, uh, on an ethical basis. Uh, um, others uh, do not stop there. <laughs> There's a, an ongoing debate, especially about his, uh, uh, if, um, another film he, he, he made between 2003 and 2013. I forget the name of the film, but it was about the uh, Abu Ghraib uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, prison, uh, the, the torture, and uh, and he was he was uh, 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 um, he was perceived as a collaborator, uh, as, as as a cowardly uh, uh, by not taking a, 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 a firm stand. He was. Actually, uh, but by which is uh, like acknowledging that the world is too complicated in order to be, uh, in order for it to be one-dimensional, uh, and you you are in a, in a way you are you are fleeing the scene. You're not uh, you're not taking a stand. Um, I I don't I don't know if I if I can see myself. Uh, 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 if I can put myself in this, in the shoes of, of, of such critiques, uh, uh, if only because, you know, I, I don't know what I, I would have done as a filmmaker uh, uh, in, in the same uh, in the same situation. But it, it, it's a it's a fair question, and in my mind, it's a good question. But what sticks out in the end is this one shot we've seen, uh, Rumsfeld, surrounded by words like brutal. Dictator, obviously his face, and of course it's some it's some uh, some explanation to maybe cl clarify what he's talking about. But at the same time, what we see, what we perceive, is he talking about Saddam Hussein, yeah. about George Bush, about we himself? We see him. We see him, and, and we, we see, see the words dictator exactly. and brutal. Exactly. Right. So that might also give us, for clips of a second, an idea about some ethical judgment. I think the two questions go together in a somewhat surprising way, in the sense that, I mean, one, one was, um, you know, one is about the suspension of disbelief and the playfulness involved in attending to a narrative, um, and the, the other is about these, you know, super somber questions about um, the possibility of ethical or moral judgment, you know, in a, um, you know, in a sort of sophisticated post-structuralist, maybe, or postmodern or deconstructive you know, sense, I mean, literally, as Shai was pointing out, I mean, Errol Morris is clearly, I don't know about the term postmodern, we were talking about this last week, um, <laughs> no, but I mean, I take, you know, but, but, but post-structuralist, for sure, I mean, Errol Morris is, so his philosophical lineage is, uh, you know, is, is, is Anglo-American analytic, but, um, but, but the conversation is the same, and so on a continental perspective, this post-structural, whatever, the words don't really matter, what matters is um, the sense that any approach to truth comes from the starting point that we can only access something that's truer or falser from a um, you know therapeutic or deconstructive approach to truth claims. We can't go making positive truth claims anymore, which of course has this ironic condition that it looks like a positive claim about the impossibility of positive claims. Um, the reason why I think these two things go together is that it's there in book 10 already, I think, and in the fuller, in the version, in the talk that I might have given, um, you know, or, or that, I, that I could. And by the way, plug, this comes from a work that uh, Shai and I are editing together called Plato and the Moving Image, forthcoming from Brill 2019, God help us. Um, so, uh, so stay tuned, you know, uh, it, it's, in, it's in the works. but. Um, 
that there are these two, ana these two analyses where in the first one, um, uh, Plato Socrates or Plato makes this, um, this cheating move with the painter. Um, I think Paul's absolutely right. I mean, it's the, the, and that's the famous one. Everyone who does the three level analysis from book 10, whether they're defending it in some way or whether they're attacking it, the platonic assault on imitative art um, is based on the first version. And I don't know why it's the more famous version and that's where the painter and the poet get collapsed, which is just wrong. I mean, that, I agree. And, that, and right after that, we get the claim about us being fooled like small children at 600A, you know, that even the best of us, for crying out loud, gets seduced by Homer. And this is where the fevered pitch of the collapse of Homer into the cheap, you know, decorator of walls. I mean, this is a really cheap platonic move. But right after that, we get the interesting three version, um, uh, the interesting second version of the three layers, which I think is what that's what I was hearing in this restaged, um, you know, platonic dialogue. And if you go to that one, what, what he says is the three layers aren't about imitation, really. I mean, the question is still mimesis on some level, but it's now the mode of relation with respect to truth. The top layer is knowledge, and this is exactly post-structuralist, that's what I'm trying to say. The top layer is knowledge, which is maybe impossible. There's no God anymore, by the way. There are only human beings in the second version of the three-tier analysis. And in the, we have knowledge, we have right opinion, which is like, and his example here is a flute, by the way. So, but I, I think that Errol Morris is a flute player in, 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 in the sense of book 10. He made his own device, or uh, you know, Peter Jackson, the same way. I mean, imagining the devices that an early 20th century filmmaker, this is totally book 10 stuff. This is exactly the game that Plato is, um, is playing there. So a flute or a interrotron or a bicycle. <laughs> Steam machine. Steam machine. I mean, what it, you have, the idea is you have a maker of such a thing who has a right opinion about it. You have the user of such a thing who has knowledge. Um, and then you have us, basically, who have trust. And that's your suspension of disbelief that Literally, that's the, that's the epistemological relation from the divided line called pistis. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what we have in the cave, of course. It's, it, it, this is literally what Plato is saying. And so the, this post-structuralist problem is just in platonic terms, what, what happens if we abandon the possibility of knowledge? What the user of the interatron, the ideal user of the interatron, when we know that we're all kind of biasing, or whatever, you know, right? And, uh, you know, we have right opinions about these mirrors, and, um, but we don't believe that anyone possibly could uh, have knowledge. Um, and so that's why I think the two kind of go together in the sense that Plato is saying really all we have is the suspension of disbelief. That's why then he makes a little dog and pony show at the end with the, <laughs> with the myth of her, right? He says, it's not real. You know, it's a true story. It's a totally true story about Err, this make makeup guy, you know. Um, but of course, for him, it was meant to be the thing that we have, right opinion, while we're searching for knowledge. Like, and and we questions. don't believe that questions. anymore. I have two questions. Sorry. That First took of all, Alan Bloom, in his interpretive essay, right. in his translation, says there is very, very little chance that Socrates. Socrates believed in the immortality of the individual soul. Yeah. And I want to know your take on that. But second, what would these guys say about the Dio? Oh, uh, in, my, in, in, in my chapter, which is called <laughs> The Myth of Ur. Thank you for asking. <laughs> you read that out from the index card perfectly. Um, the, the Myth of Ur as rationalizing recording device. I suggest that the myth of Ur is <laughs> the handheld, you know, tell us about Ur, Socrates. Uh, I think that Alan Bloom is wrong, um, but I know, where, I know where he's coming from. Where is he coming from? Uh, so he's coming from, uh, okay. 
So like last week, we were talking about Strauss in this room. <laughs> and um, Leo Strauss was Alan Bloom's uh, teacher, Alan Bloom being the translator of choice on this campus, a uh, translator of the Republic into English. And um, this, this, this is a story that a tradition of Plato interpreters has based on a, a, an esoteric tradition that's in a, a group of interpreters of Plato who are um, Abrahamic believers who are certain that, um, that, um, that Plato is engaging in a kind of sleight of hand in his afterlife myths. There's one in Republic that we read here together, and then there are four other famous ones. Um, and they're related to each other in different ways. And for this interpretive school, um, it's, it's a matter of faith that Plato himself didn't believe it. And their reasons, are, uh, their reasons for this are by putting a lot of weight on the fact, the historic fact, that Plato had unwritten teachings and that the unwritten teachings would have included, for instance, the non-immortality of the individual soul. Um, and then there's a longer story about that. But the reason why this really matters for the questions that we're asking about Book 10, I think, is that um, it has everything to do with why the myth of Ur ends the book. If Plato absolutely didn't believe in the immortality of the soul, then it looks like he's Errol Morris, I think. I don't know if I understood your question right, but that's a relation for me at least, right? In other words, he ends the book with a story that couldn't possibly be true by his lights. And then, then it's really just all the cave. This is just a better dog and pony show. And we're just, we're trucking on the same suspension of disbelief that Homer is exploiting. Um, whereas if Plato, I don't know, I don't pretend <laughs> to knowing what Plato believed or didn't believe, but I disbelieve that Alan Bloom or others know that Plato didn't believe in the immortality of the soul because it seems to me far more likely that the myth of Ur is in the sense of the second three kinds of skue analysis, that, like, that the particular song that Plato is playing at the end of the Republic is something that is right opinion. The truth is something like that. The soul is immortal, um, and there is something like an eternal punishment or a thousand-year punishment after we die if we don't live well in this world. Like, I actually think he believes that. Um, and I don't think any of us believe, or by and large, I don't think it's very possible to believe things like that anymore, and that's why I think the two questions kind of go together. Like, the best we can do is the suspension of disbelief, like to live in somebody else's narrative or to read the signs correctly, to kind of see how the, the narrative context holds together or could hold together, and that's what would make it authentic. Um, but it's very difficult for us to, to actually not just suspend our disbelief, but to grant ourselves the permission to believe, which is very different. Um, and the, those would be the stakes of, you know, it's not just I can present, you know, Rumsfeld as a kind of brutal dictator of a kind. It's really saying there's a matter of fact, you know, about evil in the world. The way that McNamara believed, at least, that he wasn't post structural that way. He believed there still was, whereas Rumsfeld really does think it's all mirrors. You know, we can all, we can just construct. Sorry. No, I, I know you have another question here, but in yeah. terms of video, like, you know, he talks about, oh, well, imitation, easy. Just carry a mirror around. Around, yeah. Everything that captures in the mirror, you know, you've essentially, you're imitating. What about this device? What do you make of this? <laughs> is it the same thing? Is it just that easy? Is it? Uh, I can tell you that uh, my entire being changes when I'm aware of its existence. You know, I, 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 I was sitting here listening to, to, to Michael, and all of a sudden it's strange. I had, had this inner dialogue with Shaidi. Are you aware that you're being. You're being shot right now? 
to use the, 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 the traditional term. Exactly. That's why in the, the uh, where is it, the great, uh, the great robbery, you know, the film from 1903, I think, mm -hmm. ends with uh, um, uh, one of the characters shooting. shooting at the camera, which shoots it. Double taking on the concept of shooting. We, we had this conversation this afternoon very briefly about, uh, because I asked the Shai the same question, what, what would Plato uh, say knowing about actually film and cinema, so not maybe video, but cinema, and then he said that he would, we would need another Plato before that, right? So uh, we are here because of Plato, what he thought and what he has written down. And uh, if we would move him through time, to witness it, film. it wouldn't have been played. Yeah, it would not be Plato, right? So mm. we would need another author or something coming before Plato. So it's it's it's, it's in, a in order big for, for, for a modern Plato to have a retake yeah. Yeah. on the old Plato, you would have to be the old Plato. Yeah. It it has changed. Film has changed the world now, perception of the world, right? And even more so. Monday evening I was at the Open Studios, I watched some of the student films and uh, I had different thoughts about that, with the way young people today just learn growing up with using these kind of, in the cell phone, smartphone, producing hours and hours of film on a global scale every day, sharing images, moving images, uh, that have become kind of second nature, not even virtual reality, second nature people using this to express themselves. I saw a lot of images, you know, out of focus there. I was about to teach the kids how to use the focus on camera, but of course it's part of the aesthetic to shot images out of focus, right? To give us a, a reflection of the world we're in that is out of focus, as it were, right? And um, So I think video slash film is such an important, powerful, magical, technological yeah. thing that Again, it's a bit like sitting in the cave. You can only try to understand actually what, what, what it means. Because we are, we are in the middle of it, right? We are in the matrix somehow. Uh, we, sh we should ask some kind of Martian or whatever. Uh, what about these human beings and film and this obsession with recording images or taking snapshots of photographies all the time, communicating them to other people? There's some kind of ma like an atavistic, magical, uh, power to images, like you know, film steals your soul, captures your yeah. soul. So I, I know I'm kind of running mm -hmm. a mocking, yeah. uh, but uh, there's something that's almost unexplicable, the power of film, and it changes the world, it changes our perception of the world, and I don't know what Plato would have said about this, but it's true, it would not have been Plato if he would have thought about yeah, it. Yeah, following what you just said, just a very, very brief anecdote, uh, which I was reminded by. Uh, um, a, 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 a three years old girl, uh, the daughter of a neighbor of ours, uh, came to her mother uh, in, I was present at the time, so it's a true story, uh, um, <laughs> and, and said to, to, to her mother, uh, uh, Mommy, the, the, the sun is in my eyes, can you do something about it? <laughs> and she made these gestures as if the, 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 the sun, the platonic sun, the real sun, <laughs> reality, was just a map. Um, and uh, come to think of it, you don't have to be three years old in order to, to embrace, in one way or another, this kind of uh, conceptualization of the world. Because uh, in the, uh, just so that you added another apparatus to the uh, uh, recording uh, device. <laughs> 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 as, as if the one is not enough. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are constantly recording. We are constantly documenting. When, and, we and when we used to document 20 or 30 years ago, we, 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 we documented with, with uh, 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 an apparatus which ran out of batteries or was limited in the, in the number of, of still frames it could capture. And then we had to uh, 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 expose them to light and put them in, 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 a, in a photo album and then go back to them 10 or 20 years after and see how we used to look like when we were younger. 
Now we are documenting without any purpose. Mm. We are documenting for the, safe, for the sake of documenting. So it's not documenting. It's just creating a constant flow of, of images. Because and that's, that's reality. Our, because that's, that's our reality. We are not without images. We are not. We don't exist. So I take pictures, thus I am. <laughs> <laughs> but since you mentioned the sun, that's I mean, the in, in the... In the, in the, uh, the modern Descartes. I didn't mention it before, but I was thinking about it. Since you mentioned the the the, the, sun, you know, the, the platonic sun, whatever, the, the, the Jew, the, uh, the Star Wars clip started with an image of the sun. Uh, the, at the very beginning, is this blinding light. Of course, it's not the sun that we know, but it's the blinding light of a sun. And then the camera moves on into the shadow, uh, as it were, into the cave. But at the very beginning of this film... Much, it's like, much like in uh, yeah. Stanley Kubrick's Space Odyssey? Yes, right. The uh, Dawn of Man is... a. So there's one giant monolith, whatever, just like a giant rectangle, <laughs> and, and springs out out of the blue without any causal uh, relations or any, any 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 reason whatsoever, and it blocks the sun or it unveils the sun, yeah. or it blocks and and un unveils the sun at the same time. So and this can only be captured in a moving image. I think we need to wrap up yeah, okay. uh, for perfectly mundane reasons, but maybe we could collect the last two questions that there were, and um, then a final. Yeah, uh, my question would be actually be more related to the cinema than the film, for the fact that film after being shot would have to be projected in the projectors, and as we just did, sitting in this room and looking at the screen collectively. And if we take back and go back to the discussion just now, about um, how film itself actually capture passively the reality and the materiality of it, and kind of stays within before actually being given meaning and being put into context by the spectatorship. It kind of stands in between the very materiality and be become animation, and be become animated again in this spectatorship. So I just wonder, to a certain extent, would the um, this cursed quality of his film itself that is keep replicated in this being perceived this um, you know our watching experience actually change the quality of representation into a democratic one probably that how film actually to a certain extent exactly because of this spectator spectatorship orientation to a certain extent its value and its quality actually create a form of reality or truth that is somehow democratic that is. Um, as how our suspension of belief, actually what is beyond it, is probably a discipline that we agreed on collectively. So I just wonder what, what is the potential or the risk actually even behind this, this kind of quality of the spectatorship actually democratically creating the representation, representative quality of it and the value of it. And uh, another quick question is, um, 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 how moving picture itself is a very is, is a force of irrationality. Yeah, I would just shot it that way. No, I, I think in a way these two questions are, th are tied together, two, two sides of the same coin, at least in the sense that there's an extensive writing, uh, philosophical writing these days on, on both uh, uh, the spe spectatorship or spectatorship theory and the uh, 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 digital uh, technology, which uh, oversees the, uh, the moving image. Um, and the one point that combines these two together is, uh, uh, where did I read this phrase? Uh, in, in, uh, in a recent film by uh, a, a, a Scottish scholar named uh, um, um, David Jacobon, who wrote a, a book on in which he coined the phrase digital logic, a kind of thinking which is uh, 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 which finds room in the digital era, but did not require the technology in order to exist. Mm -hmm. Even before the, kind, the technology supports this kind of, of mass thinking. So in a way, uh, if we go back to spectatorship, the way we react, uh, the way we uh, uh, um, we are the extension of 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 the 
of the film via the cinematic experience. And um, it's, it doesn't really rely on actual audience. I mean, the interpretive aspect of the spectators are not tied to specific audience or to a, a, a empirical, a, 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 a empirical experience or knowledge about spectatorship. And spectatorship is, is, a, is, a, is a conceptual uh, a state of affairs. Spectatorship is, is, uh, uh, had the capacity or has, has uh, have the capacity to, to, uh, 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 to, to explicate meaning, for instance, digital meanings, digi to, to follow the kind of logic that the digital world uh, enforces on us, even before uh, uh, the digital technology exists. So it, it's something which is engraved within the concept of, or the possibility of spectatorship, within the role of spectators in this phenomenon, which is the moving image. That's my two cents for us. I think with the proviso that the next conversation has to be the Republic and the transition from film to di from analog to digital moving images, uh, we maybe should close because it's a uh, big uh, can of worms to open. Um, so that's a big dodge. But I think it's right to say that um, there's a tremendous, that, that of course the locus classicus is the cave and the way that the cave seems to um, pre-image or foreshadow early cinema. I mean, which was of course this analog um, phenomenon with, with all these implications, I mean, also for the conditions of, possible conditions of spectatorship that are abolished by um, the digital age, but also that, in fact, as um, is being demonstrated right now, um, <laughs> in a way that's rather uncanny, um, it <laughs> seems no <laughs> as though uh, it actually is the case that um, book 10, uh, I think, is actually a better locus uh, for thinking about the moving image today in relation to Plato, because we don't live in the cave in that sense. We don't live in um, the analog. We watch films on our handheld devices. We don't, and we're not together. So on the one hand, it's more democratic in the sense that you can do it yourself, in the sense that you don't have expensive um, apparatus uh, involved. It's also much less, perhaps, democratic in the sense that um, we lose what uh, you could call a shared world. That um, increasingly the moving image is like everyone's holding a mirror going around, except that the mirror, like the Interatron, is like constantly reflecting back. And actually, what we see isn't the back of the mirror, um, but rather the projection of the other side of the mirror being reflected back to us in our mirror that actually faces the other way. What's the other side? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, right. Can you just use an image to use <laughs> Anyway, that's the, that's the follow-up for next time. Thank you all for coming.